So exegesis, why we continue to use this word, I do not know. Uh, it is a, one of those traditional in-house words that specialists in divinity schools like to use, and we throw it around loosely uh, when we are in the midst of congregations and lay people who have no idea what it is we're talking about. Uh, but stripped of all of its mystery, exegesis is nothing but trying to make sense of a text. That's all it is. And we try to do this at two different levels. The first level uh, has to do with the intellectual approach to the text. The text has to be intelligible. You need to understand what the text is saying. And I mean that not in any kind of uh, deep theological way. I mean it just in a very common sense English language way. You need to understand what the text is saying. And it's only after you have figured out what it is that the words mean that and what it, only after you understand the concepts that the writers are using, only when you begin to understand any particular images that they may be including in the text, only then can you move on to the second phase, which is answering the questions that you brought to the text, the reasons that you came to it in the first place. You may have had it assigned to you as part of a lectionary reading or in an artificial exercise like this one where you are being asked to comment on a text uh, which you have no particular questions about yet, but eventually you will once you begin to go through them. Only then can you get to the theological appropriation of the text once you understand what the text says. Uh, and what we're going to be doing today and in the discussion groups is mostly concentrating on part one. That is, we're going to be looking at the processes involved in simply trying to understand what the text says in common sense, ordinary language. Now, we've already looked at various components of exegesis. And so we're going to try in this exegetical exercise that we're going to do in the discussion groups to put all of that together in one way or another. And I'll explain in today's lecture how this is going to work. Exegesis begins, as I've already suggested, by asking questions of the text, which will finally reveal the text's meaning. Learning the art of exegesis is uh, simply nothing more than learning which questions are likely to produce answers. You can ask all sorts of questions of a text that the text has no particular interest in answering. And you need to recognize what kinds of questions are appropriate for what kinds of texts. Now, after you live with scripture for a while, after you read it and study it and meditate on it, you will begin to know intuitively what kinds of questions to ask of the text and which questions are likely to generate answers. Until you do that, you're going to do a lot of blundering. You're going to ask a lot of questions that don't have answers, or you're going to get a lot of answers that don't finally help to illuminate the text. Still, you're going to have to accept that as part of the learning process. So that's the first piece of good news with exegesis. You get better at it the more you do of it. And if you don't like your first efforts, if you keep at this long enough, you will eventually get better at it. And here the analogy with preaching is pretty obvious. Uh, at the beginning, it's a struggle. Later on, the problem is trying to uh, decide which of the many things you could say about a particular text in a sermon are the ones you want to say in a particular day. <laughs> 
Uh, you will have lots and lots of ideas. You will get better at this art uh, the more you work at it. And exegesis is a kind of art form. And so you need to uh, get to know it through practicing it. And that's what we are doing here. What I'm going to do today is to suggest a series of steps that you might go through so that you can work through the text systematically. Not all of these steps are going to be relevant to every text, but at the beginning you should go through them all to be sure that you don't leave anything out. Uh, as you get better at it, you can begin to shorten the process. Uh, this, in fact, is a model that is based on medical education. If any of you have ever been in medical school or um, talked to doctors who have been through that process, and I hope all the doctors you see have, uh, <clears throat> you, will, you will know that when they are taught to do a physical exam, a baseline physical exam, they have a particular order in which they always do it. This varies from person to person and school to school how they teach this. But they are taught to go through the same steps each time. And that's so that if they get distracted, if they're carrying on a conversation with you while they're trying to do this, they, because they do this in the same order every time, uh, the doctor does not have to say, gee, I'm uh, listening to the chest right now. Uh, have I done the ears yet? Did I remember to do the ears? Uh, the answer is probably going to be yes, because they're probably going to start at the top and work their way down. That's the way they do it. And so the doctor can say, well, yeah, I'm working on the chest. I much have, must have already done the ears and not found anything peculiar there, so I'm on to the next stage. Uh, and that's the way exegesis is, that you learn to do this in a particular order for no particular reason, except that it makes sure that you don't leave anything out. Uh, so let me underline again that these steps I'm about to walk through with you are steps in preparation for an exegesis. They are not the exegesis itself the exegesis itself and the paper that you're going to be producing looks different from this. But one hopes is based on the kind of background study that these questions will lead you through. All right, uh, let me uh, start in then on the different stages of preparation for doing an exegesis. Uh, to quote Wellhausen, his prolegomena and so on, this is a prolegomena to exegesis. This is what you do at the beginning before you actually commit an exegesis. All right. Uh, so the first step is obviously the selection of the passage. Now this is not as straightforward as you might think, and so it does require some thought. Uh, you may just stumble on it. That is, you may be reading scripture for some other reason, uh, and I hope you do, uh, because reading it systematically is the best way, finally, to use it in preaching or to get familiar with it, uh, to read things that you don't have to read and to read large chunks of it. That's something that you ought to try to do uh, anyway, as part of the shaping of your own spiritual life. Uh, so you may just stumble on a passage and say, gee, that's interesting, I never looked at that before, or I never thought about that before. I wonder what that is about. Or you may have it assigned to you. And the, the normal way in which this uh, assignment takes place for you, if you are in a um, lectionary-based church, is to have it as a part of the lectionary. There will be passages that are given to you for each particular occasion, and the lectionary may simply assign it. Now, this is probably the time to say a couple of things about lectionary assignments. The first is that they often do not follow any known means of identifying passages. <laughs> 
Sometimes you will look at them and suddenly discover that the lectionary begins in the middle of a verse or ends in the middle of a verse. It may omit things that seem to you to be crucial to the passage. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, you can figure out why the lectionary is doing this. Uh, I once asked uh, a Catholic scholar, Roland Murphy, who was part of Vatican II's reshaping of the Catholic lectionary, uh, where these lectionary passages actually came from. And he basically said they are old, they are medieval, and frankly, nobody knows where they came from or why they look the way they look. And the Catholic lectionary in the West is going to be the basis of most of the Protestant lectionaries, which are similarly based on uh, this kind of old traditional reading. So you have to be careful if the lectionary assigns a passage. Uh, you also need to remember that the chapter and verse divisions are not necessarily accurate markers of where a passage begins or ends. Uh, the chapter and verse divisions are uh, devices that were invented uh, fairly late in the interpretive tradition. In the Hebrew Bible, they were done under the influence of New Testament scholarship as a way of citing passages uh, which uh, appeared in the Christian Jewish polemics that were popular in the Middle Ages. So in our Hebrew text, we don't have chapter or verse numbers until the medieval period. So this is a fairly late point. Uh, sometimes the units in the Hebrew text are marked off, and we see this already at Qumran, by the use of spaces rather than numbers. They will put spaces to mark sections of the text that are liturgically important, that is the markers of synagogue readings and where the, pas the passage begins and where the passage ends. Uh, but they don't number them. If they are going to cite them, they simply cite the first words of the overall unit, even though the verses that they may be referring to are not at the beginning of the unit. So if they say this is in uh, Bereshit bara, this is the first chapter of Genesis, you, they don't tell you necessarily where in the first chapter of Genesis the words they're, being, they're discussing are appearing. So you need to be alert to that when you see these things. Uh, for those of you who have taken New Testament, you know that there is some suspicion that citations in the New Testament are done in the same way. Uh, in some cases, that is, they will refer vaguely to a, a unit, but not necessarily the words that they are most concerned with. And you're expected to know that because, after all, you know the text by memory. And therefore, you will be able to come up with all of this. Uh, we don't, and so we have to work harder at it to determine just what the units are. Uh, but a good way of trying to tell whether uh, a unit is, has its own integrity, that is, that it is really a unit, is to read the unit within its larger context. That is, you ought to find a reasonably large chunk of the context of the verses that you're interested in to see just where they fit in the overall larger unit that contains them. And uh, again, eventually you will know this when you get a, a, an assignment of a lectionary uh, unit, for example. You will look at it and say, oh yeah, that's immediately after this and it's before that. But you ought to, at the very beginning, look at that surrounding material to be sure that you are beginning the passage where it ought to really begin and ending it where it ought to really end. So. Uh, this is the same move you made when you were studying form criticism. Where does the unit begin? Where does the unit end? Are there clear markers for a beginning and clear markers for an end? Or are we basing our decision that this is a unit simply on content? That is, it seems to cohere as a unit, looking at the content. 
and there are not necessarily formal markers at the beginning or formal markers at the end. You'll understand this a bit more when you get to the Psalms and when you get to prophetic literature, uh, where uh, prophetic oracles typically begin, thus says the Lord, and maybe end in the same way, says Yahweh. Uh, and those are markers, those are formal markers of beginning and end. But in prose, we don't always get that. So you uh, frequently in prose need to look at the contents. So they're telling a coherent story, and you want to know where that story begins. Um, if you told Little Red Riding Hood without the wolf, you would, you would know that this is a truncated story. It's not all of the material that ought to be there. So after you're satisfied that you're dealing with a coherent unit, then I would suggest, and this is purely my suggestion, that you read the passage several times slowly and carefully. And as you write down, as you do this, write down your first impressions on a piece of paper. Anything at all. It doesn't have to be coherent. Uh, it can be comments. It can be questions to yourself. All sorts of questions, literary questions, theological questions, historical questions. Uh, this may prevent you later on from seeing all of the trees but missing the forest. You can read this passage for the first time only once, which is an obvious thing. I mean, people say read it as if it were read for the first time. You really can't do that. Once you have read it, you have read it and you've already formed your opinion of what this is about. So doing it a couple of times is helpful in making sure you haven't missed anything. But these first impressions, uh, the questions that you formulate, the uh, questions about words, you don't want to answer those questions as you're going through the first time. Just write them down so you'll remember them. And then later on you can go back and try to figure out what the answers are. And they may be quite simple questions. They may be there's a word in the translation that you don't really understand. Uh, modern translators of the Bible uh, have recently been very good at editing their stuff. And they have been warned by the publishers not to include words that are too obscure in the translation, as accurate as they might be. Uh, because the general reading public does not understand those words. Uh, it's not quite as bad as a recent project, which I will not name, uh, that is being pub uh, published by a publisher, I will not name either, of a new translation, which is for people who have less than an eighth grade education. That is, you cannot use words that are not supposed to be in the vocabulary of the average eighth grader. So uh, that is unduly restrictive. I think most publishers are not quite there yet. But they're very good about weeding out words that uh, they think are not going to be intelligible. And therefore, if you were reading the Psalms in the current Anchor Bible, by, which is translated by Mitchell DeHood, and you get to the Psalm that includes the words, you have put a snaffle on the wind, unless you ride horses a lot, uh, you probably want to look up the word snaffle eventually because you're, it's not the soft drink. Uh, this is a wholly different thing. And uh, whether it helps in understanding exactly what is going on, I don't know. But uh, it's something you definitely would want to put on your little list of things uh, to come back later on. The next thing, and this is step two if you're counting, uh, is making sure that you have a stable text. Now, I'm going to mention this, but the number of times when this is important are minimal. Uh, this is not something you're going to run into, and certainly you're not going to run into it in either of the exercise passages that we have given you. Uh, worrying about the integrity of the text is not something that you need to do for this exercise. Uh, the best way to do this, of course, is to read the text in Hebrew. And if you do that, then you will immediately begin to spot things that look unusual to you. Now, if all Hebrew looks unusual to you, 
then you have to go to translations to help you. And so you need to know a few things about translations. Uh, the best way to spot places where there are underlying textual problems is to compare different translations. And this is why you ought to own several different translations uh, so that you can quickly look through a passage in several translations. And if you begin to get significant variance in the translations, you know that there is probably an underlying textual problem that scholars do not agree on. Now, this will also come up in the ancient versions, the Greek version of the Septuagint, the Latin version of the Vulgate, the Syriac version of the Peshitta, and so on. Those will also reflect underlying difficulties in the text that they are translating. And if sometimes it's not a linguistic issue. Sometimes it's a theological issue. So the Greek has a very different take on the theological underpinning of a particular text than the Hebrew text does. Uh, all of these exist in English translation. You can go to the library or go online and find English translations of the Greek and try to do the comparison that way if you don't read Greek and similarly for Latin, and similarly for Syriac, and similarly for the Aramaic of the Targums. There are available translations if you really get into it. I understand that you don't have all the time in the world to do stuff like that, but uh, at least looking at some other English language translations is a good start. Among the translations, any good critical translation will work for that exercise. Uh, the Jewish Publication Society and the uh, NRSV, which are the two that I recommended for this course, uh, will differ from each other, and that's because of the guidelines to the translators. The idea of Jewish Publication Society was to get as far away as possible from the old King James translation, whereas the mantra for the translators of the RSV, on which the new RSV is based, were to stay as close as possible to the old King James translation because there was going to be a big pushback from the general audience, they thought correctly, as it turned out, uh, moving away from the old hallowed King James translation, which everybody had knew and had grown up with. And so they were taking a great risk in giving a new translation, they thought, and staying as close to the old King James was the best way to resolve that problem. Uh, the new RSV is uh, published in a different climate where the translators and the publishers were less fearful of disturbing the faithful, and therefore they are much more likely to translate what they think is really there uh, than uh, were the RSV translators, which were um, bound by these sorts of guidelines. It is also the case, particularly if you are using an annotated translation, but even if you're not using one of the annotated translations, uh, the annotated translations will always point out ambiguities or problems in the underlying original text. And you can use that as a sign that, you know, this is a problem here and this is why they're translating this way, or they may give you an alternative translation. But the editors of the text may do that in the margin anyway. Uh, and so uh, quite frequently in the uh, Hebrew of the NR, even in the NRSV, they will have a marginal note that will read something like Greek, which means they are following in their translation the Greek text rather than the Hebrew text. And sometimes they will tell you why. They will say Hebrew obscure, which is to say they can't make any sense out of the Hebrew text. And so they're wanting to know what the ancient Greek translators made of it. And they will then include in their translation the uh, uh, Greek translator's idea of what the Hebrew means, which at least gets it back into antiquity. Uh, on the translation side. Uh, 
the problem with translation is that you have to put something in there. Uh, that is, you have to say something if you're a translator. And this is usually done by committee, which I know is even more disturbing to some of the faithful. I've, uh, a friend of mine wrote me an email one time asking me about a problem in Psalms and he quoted a particular verse and he said, I'm looking at three different translations and they all translate this differently. So what is the right translation? And I said, I have no idea what the original, what the best translation is. What you're getting here is the fact that when they, the uh, editors of this translation got together in a group, uh, they took a vote on which translation they thought best represented the original text, and this was the winner in your translation. That's the way translation is done. So that leaves lots of room. I mean, it may be that the minority reading is the best reading, and so sometimes you will get the minority reading in the margin. Or you will get, in, particularly in the case of the, because of the people who were doing the translation, the Jewish Publication Society is really fond of the note in the margin, emendation yields. And that means that the translation is something that they have gotten by emending the Hebrew text. Uh, and there were several people on that committee it was a small committee, and there were several people who were used to doing that kind of emendation. Uh, that's something that does not happen quite as much in other translations. So they usually will flag this for you if there is a genuine problem. I will also say almost never does this um, impact the meaning, the overall meaning of a passage. That is, rarely does this kind of problem um, yield this kind of, of uh, import if you're doing a translation. Two, where it does, are obvious and, and notorious. Uh, the first one is Isaiah 7:14. Therefore, the Lord to yourself, this is, this is the confrontation between Isaiah and Ahab, you haven't, or Ahaz, you haven't uh, taken this up yet, but you know it. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, and here I'm reading NRSV, the young woman is with child, uh, note says, or Greek reads virgin, which of course is what the New Testament is quoting in the Greek text. Uh, that word has been known to mean young woman of marriageable age for a very long time. But the translators of RSV 1 were afraid to depart from the King James translation there because the passage was so sensitive in theological debates among Christians. And so they wimped out and translated with the King James, even though all the translators knew that was not the way the the thing ought to be translated. Uh, if I were to translate it, if this were a Hebrew course, it ought to be translated. E the woman is even. The young woman is even now pregnant, and is about to bear a son. That's the way the participial forms ought to be translated, and we know that. I mean, it's straightforward grammar and straightforward lexicography. Um, but that's the way translators have to work. In this case, the translation you use makes a theological difference. Uh, in the uh, famous Kohelet thing, uh, passage in, in Ecclesiastes 3.11, you get this very odd phrase, you have made everything beautiful in its time. This is now popular, of course, from the uh, folk song that is based on this passage. Uh, you have made everything beautiful in its time, but you have put eternity into the human mind, and then the text is completely uh, nonsensical after that. So that, uh, and then something about understanding. And people have been worried about that, not only the image, what does putting eternity in the human mind mean, 
Well, it looks like the word etern translated eternity is not the word that is in the Hebrew text. Uh, it's written oddly for that word, olam. It's olam without the, the uh, long vowel being indicated. And it is very likely that it comes from a totally different root. Uh, it doesn't mean eternity, it means darkness, and I won't get to how that works, but it makes perfect sense in context. It just knocks the props out of every interpretation of that passage that you will see. You have made everything beautiful in its time, but you have put darkness into the human mind, and then the rest of it makes sense, so that you will not know what God is doing from the beginning to the end. That is to say, there's an order here, but you're never going to find it. And that's thoroughly in keeping with what else we know about this writer. That has been the writer, uh, that's been the complaint of the writer in Ecclesiastes since the very beginning, that God is simply tantalizing people, thinking that they know what is going on in the world, what is really real in the world. That's a different, uh, whole different discussion that you'll get to in the uh, second semester. So those are places where translation makes a difference. And there, the, if you read Psalm 23, for example, in three or four different translations, you will see uh, that there is a lot of disagreement about the nuances of that psalm. It's one of our favorite psalms, but if you try to figure out exactly what is being talked about, uh, it's not as easy as it looks. So try it sometime. Uh, read Psalm 23 in uh, several different translations and just see the variation. And that indicates that there's an underlying problem in the text. At the end of the day on that one, it is so popular both in Jewish and in Christian circles that there's nothing much you can do with it except recite it in some uh, reasonable translation. But you ought to know that it's not exactly clear what you're reciting. Um, so there are um, places where this shows up. There's also a good example, of, a good example, several of them, of translation bias, and you ought to to be uh, clear about those. Uh, if you look at uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, the very beginning of the uh, book of Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry, not Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, uh, where the woman opens the conversation, and in verse five she says, Black am I and beautiful. I'm here quoting the NRSV. Black am I and beautiful, like the tents of Kedar. Referring, in this case, this is one you'd probably want to look up. Kedar is the Arabic area, and the black tents are the black tents of the Bedouin, and they are black to this day because they're made out of goatskin, and we all know from the Jacob story that goats are usually black. And she is making a positive comparison of herself to the black tents of the Bedouin. You have to go to NRSV before that was correctly translated. Uh, every other translation, going back to King James, has black am I but beautiful, which is based on the Latin which shows you what the Latin speakers thought about color. And that, it, it's correctly translated in NRSV for the first time. Black, I'm, there is no reason to translate that vav in Hebrew as adversative. It is simply a uh, connection between the two. I am black and beautiful. And so it took a very long time for that to be translated correctly and it's pure cultural bias. Uh, so that can get into any problem with translation. All right, now in reading through your passage, you may notice that there are parts of the unit that do not seem to cohere. That is, it doesn't seem to fit together in a reasonable way. There are, to put it in, an, use another idiom, there are bumps in the road as you read it. 
So you read along and then suddenly there is this bump, uh, this pothole in the road that causes you to stop for a minute and say, now wait a minute, the thought has jumped here. Or there is something that seems contradictory. Uh, they just said this and now they're saying that. And it, it looks like a press conference. Uh, they've got things that seem to be mutually contradictory in the same passage. So that's a problem that you will want to work on. You know, what is disturbing the coherence of the passage? Is it because it's not translated correctly? Is it because there are other things going on in the passage? And one of the other things may be the introduction of a new literary source. So if you are reading in the Pentateuch, and uh, this, is on, this is the only place where that kind of thing works, to uh, ask the question of literary source. This is the place where you might want to ask it. Will uh, looking at this from a source critical perspective help with this passage? Can the bump in the road be explained by the theory that we're dealing with two different literary sources which have been rather roughly put together? Is that gonna solve my problem? So you want to know whether or not the problem that you have discovered in reading is uh, going to be solved by invoking a source critical uh, explanation. This is the third thing that you ought to try. If you're outside of the Pentateuch, forget it. You can skip this step. Nobody really asks that question elsewhere, uh, except some of the neo valhausenists who want to extend this all the way into Kings, and I don't think it works in Kings, but we'll get to that later on. Um, so th that's the third part. The fourth part is, do we have a sort of typical way of telling a story that is shaping the passage that I'm looking at? Now that's a form critical question. So the fourth item you wanna look at is whether or not form criticism might help you in understanding uh, how this passage is like or unlike other examples of stories that have the same pattern. So for example, if we are reading any of the wilderness wandering stories, and we will be looking at one of those uh, in the discussion groups this week of a very long and expanded one, uh, but we've already seen them. The people murmured against Moses and Aaron and said, why didn't you let us stay back in Egypt, and so on. That's a typical way of beginning one of these wilderness stories. We have a lot of examples of stories that have that general shape. And there, uh, looking, at, doing a kind of quick form crit critical check to see whether or not there are other examples of a story that are told in the same way as the one you're looking at. And if you can find such things, then you want to know, well, what is common between the regular telling of a story like this and the story that I am telling? Let me give you a couple of quick examples. Uh, in the um, wilderness wandering stories, uh, you will find that all of the stories have either a positive or a negative outcome. That is to say, when the people murmur, uh, sometimes the answer of the deity about what they're complaining about is positive, sometimes it is negative. Uh, what kind of result are you getting in the story that you are reading? It is, is it a positive result or is it a negative result? And you need to decide um, whether that is significant. I mean, why does God respond positively? It raises a kind of theological question. Why does God respond positively to some things but not to others? And that's the kind of question then you would want to ask in your passage. Is it significant that the story looks the way that it looks? Uh, sometimes you will discover that important elements of the pattern have been omitted or modified in your story. Uh, the best example of this are the stories in Daniel uh, uh, the so-called court tales at the beginning of the book, uh, the story of the three young men in the furnace and Daniel in the lion's den. Those, all, those two stories all have the same pattern, and they are that the Israelites get themselves in trouble uh, 
because they are in a foreign land where customs differ or where people are out to get them. And so lies are told about them and they then vi wind up violating an order that the king has given. For that they are punished, usually with something that is supposed to lead to their death. If you are familiar with stories like that from the Second Temple period, you know that these in fact are martyr stories and they all follow a sort of standard pattern of the martyr story. There's always a section in which the disobedience of the, the protagonists uh, is brought out into the front. They confess that they are not going to change their attitudes or their beliefs uh, in spite of the pressure from the government to do so. And this will eventually lead to a, what is considered in the story a kind of noble death. And they become examples of how normal people ought to act. The problem with the Daniel stories, as you already know, is that these don't include a martyrdom. These are martyr stories in form, but they don't include a martyrdom. Well, I would think that would be a significant thing to notice. Uh, in one case, the uh, lions are perfectly happy with Daniel and uh, don't think he is reasonable lunch. Uh, he's just fine. They haul him out after the period of time. And uh, after that, the accusers are chucked in there in the lions and instantly devour them. So uh, Daniel is fine at the end of this. The same with the three young men. Uh, they are protected by some kind of a mysterious fourth figure who is seen by outsiders in the midst of the fire of the furnace. And uh, after this ordeal is over, the three are just fine. Uh, so these are atypical martyr stories. And in this case, the form has been varied and it's the variation which is the point. So if you find patterns through your exercise of form criticism, then you will know that um, there is something else here going on here and you need to figure out exactly what it is. Um, it's at this point also that you need to worry a little in typical form critical style about the origin or setting of this material. I mean, where, what is the context in which this material was written? Um, just a uh, quick uh, example from uh, Song of Songs 1-9, uh, where the uh, male now responding to the female's opening of Song of Songs uh, describes her and says to, uh, to a mare among the chariots of Pharaoh, I compare you, my darling. Now what in the world is that about? Uh, the thing you need to do here, unfortunately, is to go to antiquity, to a Bible dictionary or something else, and begin to figure out what Egyptian chariotry looked like. War horses are always male. And the Hebrew text is very uh, clear that horse in this thing is a mare, it's a female. Uh, there's a long explanation and history to this interpretation. I'll refer you to Marvin Pope's translation of Song of Songs in the Anchor Bible. And you can see his comments on this. He went into it as an atypical style for him. Uh, much deeper than anybody else has and has finally figured out what this odd comparison actually means. There are other examples in the Song of Songs too who are knowing something about the culture, uh, what people were wearing, uh, what jewelry looked like and so on. Uh, your neck is like the Tower of David on which they hang shields. That's a rather odd comparison. Uh, and you have to realize that necklaces were often made up of gold discs, which are here being compared to shields. Why, I do not know. Apparently they're really big gold discs, I, I don't know. <laughs> so things like this fall in the category of background information that you need to uh, pay attention to. This ought to be followed. Uh, in step five, by a close reading of the text, that is, walk your way slowly through it, 
and notice how the pieces of the text fit together and whether they do or not. So is there coherence in the text? Does the argument or the story that the text is reflecting telling you about how this all fits together? Uh, if not, you need to comment on that and worry about that uh, question of coherence. From there, you can go in a number of other directions. You can go into the tradition history of the text. That would be step six, if you have the time for it. If you're telling a story about the wilderness wanderings, there is a tradition of stories about the wilderness wanderings, and you can look at those traditions. Some of them will be uh, stories about what happened in the wilderness. Others will be just back references from somewhere else to these stories. Uh, so you may want to do uh, an inquiry into the tradition history of the passage. You will want to worry about the literary and theological context within which the passage is set. Uh, that would be step seven and so on. And finally, in step eight, you're ready to think about theological reflections on this text because you now understand it in a way that tells you what the intellectual picture of the text is. Now, there are other things you could do. You could look at the history of the interpretation of the text, and this is something that has gotten uh, very popular in recent days. You know, what did the rabbis make of this? What did the Qumran group make of this text or the themes in it? What did the New Testament make of it? What do the early church fathers have to say about it? What do the rabbis have to say about it? and so on. The, you, can, this, you can carry this on endlessly all the way up to the present time. This is the point at which you would do commentaries if you're going to use them. For this class exercise, I would be perfectly happy if you do not use commentaries. This is not meant to be an exercise in research. You'll have a chance in the second semester to write a research paper, but this is not the time for it. This is your own interpretation of the text. However, as always, if you do go to a commentary, then you ought to cite it and use the usual kinds of citations. I would prefer that you say things like, you know, Karl Barth agrees with me on the understanding of this passage uh, and not the other way around. Here I am following Karl Barth. Where, no, we want you to have reached this conclusion already, and then if you want to see if anybody else has come up with it, uh, that's the point at which it would happen, but I would just assume you'd not do that. So this is not a research paper. So what does the paper then finally look like? Uh, it ought to open with a kind of general introduction, one or two pages. This is the place where you will discuss the passage in its larger narrative context. Uh, if it is uh, associated with a particular literary source, you might want to mention that here, uh, or um, why it is a problem. Uh, you might want to talk about the authorship. Uh, all of these things may or may not be relevant to the passage you are dealing with. You might want to talk about the distinctive views of the passage, if there are any. You might want to talk about any problems of the form of the passage or the oral tradition that may be behind it. Just a kind of general introduction to the passage in a page or so and why it's worth worrying about. From there, if there are problems in the text, and there will not be for these passages, if there are pa uh, problems, give about a page to discussing them, but don't worry with it for these two passages. That's where it would go if you were going to do an exegetical paper. The bulk of the paper, so about five pages worth, is going to be an exposition of the text. That is, you're going to walk us slowly and carefully through the text from beginning to end. And this is where all of this carefully studied material that you've been putting together by looking at that's where that information goes. Uh, and so you're going to tell me when we get to verse 3, there's a bump in the road, and, and that's probably because of the following. Or you have this very strange idea of X, and uh, that 
it should be compared with Y and Z, which also raise this kind of issue, and so on. So walk us through this passage. That ought to be the bulk of the paper. If you want to give us a kind of theological reflection on it, take about a page at the end of this and do that, but no more than that. So uh, that will give you a paper somewhere between eight and 10 pages, which is what the idea is. Okay, uh, so we're gonna practice all this on uh, uh, numbers 13 and 14 in the discussion groups. For some of you, that will happen today. So it's fresh in your mind, go to it. <laughs>